Welcome to another episode of the Founder CEO Conversation. I recently sat down with David Jones, founder of the Brand Tech Group and One Young World. He's also a former global advertising CEO. David has led agencies from New York to Paris to Sydney. Now he's building the future of marketing with AI. In this episode, we talk about what shaped him as a leader from the rugby fields of Northern England to running global advertising companies. Now he's launching an innovative company. If you're an entrepreneur or fascinated with the future of marketing, this one's for you. Let's dive in. Hello, David Jones. Thank you so much for joining us for the Founder CEO Conversation. Uh, I'm excited uh, to learn more about you. It's a pleasure to be here. So I want to start off with what, what has shaped you as a person. So I'm, I'm very curious about early childhood or childhood teenage experiences that um, has had a lasting impact on you. Yeah, so look, yeah, it's a great question. There's probably a few. I mean, I think on the one hand, I was born in the north of England in middle of countryside, beautiful part of the world other than the rain, um, and so, sort of grew up with sport being a huge part of my life. So from tennis to rugby to cricket, to, I think a lot, a lot of um, what shaped my values came on the, on the sporting fields. When you're playing rugby, you know, in the freezing cold, you can't feel your hands and some big person is going to run into you to give you 80 minutes of pay <laughs> or two probably grows a bit of resilience and sort of you know the 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 even bigger thing was, was my parents so my dad um was CEO of a big textile company in the UK amazing integrity huge work ethic probably the most honest man in the world and just was an amazing role model and you know super passionate sports person similarly my mum you know artist very creative the sort of the the chair or sat on the board of this and that was always the one doing the speeches. So I grew up with a very powerful woman as a, a as a as a role model, and I think they you know they hopefully tried to drill into us um, you know decent a decent values. Uh, um, and then I think that the the one of the most memorable things was I was a I was a kind of pretty bad teenager. I think I was you know person at school most likely to end up in prison and for no reason because I had an incredibly happy childhood and I, I think one of the reasons my sister my elder sister is like the cleverest person on the planet and became like second in Great Britain in her accountancy exams and so I think I just decided there's no point in trying to be um, cleverer I'm just going to be like the worst she's going to be the best person but I'll be the worst and my parents sent me down to India for several months uh, when I was sort of 15, 16 okay. um, and I went to stay with my godmother there who's you know a really amazing woman and we sort of had this quite remarkable or I had this quite remarkable time where half of the time in Delhi and you know sort of hang in in and around embassies and that sort of life but then the the other half traveling in second class trains or around India you know we got caught in mudslides in the Himalayas I was really sick and nearly died we got kidnapped I mean it was just it was just more adventures and it just opened my eyes to the world and I think to how, you know, actually you're pretty spoiled and you've got it pretty good. And I think it probably A, taught me that I was like really spoiled and should just maybe not be quite so obnoxious. But B, it also was like, whoa, the, you know, the, the world is this crazy, amazing place. And in India back in the 1980s, you can imagine uh, very different from India today. So it's probably a combination of, you know, shaped on the sport fields, inherited from the parents and experiences like that, you know, feeding into what comes next. How did some of these things, teamwork, competitiveness from sports, resilience, the values from your parents, gaining a worldview, you know, by, an, by a young age, how did that translate i'm going to skip to you founding one young world uh in brand tech group because those are the, the traits you're talking about are very like entrepreneurial founder type of traits how have they translated into your work so look i think you know if you if you if you start with the the sports side of thing i mean i think you know a it gives you competitive nature which is probably quite useful uh, particularly in businesses where you're you're pitching but I would say more importantly, it also teaches you about teams, particularly team sports do. And, I, and rugby in particular is quite an amazing sport. I mean, if, if you're playing soccer, you know, if you're a good soccer player, other than goalkeeper, you can play anywhere. You know, you would be a world class. Whereas in rugby, you, you couldn't be. I mean, it's even more extreme than football or American football. And it just teaches you that, you know, I'm good at that, but I'd be absolutely terrible at that. And, you know, and you just learn that in a rugby team, there are probably seven or eight different, you know, body types and and skill sets and people trying to switch and do someone else's will be terrible. And you take that into the, the world of business and you sort of go, look, I know I'm good at, and what I need is to surround myself with people who, who are good at different things. And in fact, one of, one of my partners, Emma, 
quite early on after joining the company said, you know, you've hired really different people. And I said, yeah, because I don't need someone who can do what I can do. I can do that. What I need is people who can do what I can't do. So I think the teamwork thing, I think it also just teaches you, you know, one of the constant themes you will hear from every single entrepreneur. And I, and I honestly think you believe this is truer as you get older is, you know, actually most entrepreneurs who've done really well will say to you, it's because I work really, really, really hard. I worked harder than anyone else. And you know, if you want to succeed in sports, you have to put more training in and work harder than anyone. And I love that. I love the Kobe Bryant where he talks about, you know, how he would get up at 4 a.m. and go to the gym so he could get two gym sessions in because he worked out after 10 years. He would have basically been to the gym twice as much as anyone else. And I honestly think it's true. If you work harder, you'll get on. So I think that probably all comes from the, the sports side of things. I mean, I think you know, the, the, the lessons from my, my parents sort of quite similar. I mean, my dad, you know, huge integrity, um, and all, and authenticity, uh, super humble. I uh, probably not quite as humble as, as I should be, but he was amazing, you know, amazing achiever. And yet, if you talk to him, you know, you would kind of think he was kind of average at, at, at everything and he was actually exceptional. Um, and then I think, you know, seeing my mum, you know, leading on stage speaking, you sort of grow up thinking, yeah, actually that's kind of, you know, cool. I should, I should be doing that. And then I think just the worldview, I mean, you know, if I trace back in my career, if I hadn't actually moved around the world, I'd probably be, you know, running a mid-sized ad agency in, in the UK right now. And it's all the times where I, you know, went to business school in Germany, went to live and work in Paris, went down to Sydney, Australia, came across to New York. It's all of those things that not only gave me great life experiences, but actually ended up being huge accelerators in the career. I mean, you know, who knew when as a 20 something, I went to work in Paris and through that learned French, that actually that would be the reason that, you know, many years later I could run a French public listed company because there's no way they would have allowed me to do it without fluent French. But I didn't go to France age 24 going, oh my God, I'm going to learn French because one day I will run a French public listed company. You know, the thing that gave me my big break in the first ad agency was that I sp spoke fluent German and they had a big pitch for Henkel in Germany. And I got ridiculous responsibility at a very young age because it's like, hey, we'll send David off to Germany. Like no one else wants to go. <laughs> and so I think that that kind of that world, um, you know, whether you want to call it worldview or, or just excitement and openness to the world was the thing that, you know, took me to a lot of places, which at the time you might have gone, well, that, you know, I remember moving down to Australia. I was the, the youngest board director at the time at Abbott Mead Vickers BBDO. It was the biggest ad agency in Britain. I was running the number one account in Britain and it was kind of like, you know, heir apparent. And I left all of that to go and run a relatively small ad agency in Australia. And I was like, what? And it led to, le you know, launching Australia's first ever internet agency. What, what were you doing that stood out? I mean, it's you you, you impressed people and, and took on that responsibility and made the most of it. What were the things you were doing that um, allowed for you to... I mean, I think... That I think what you what I just basically obsessed about doing is if someone asked me to do something, say yes and do it well. You know, get your head down, don't play politics. A belief that if, if you actually work hard and deliver, you know, in the long run, that will that will come through. And I think the early kind of moves in the career were very much about, well, you know, David speaks German, stick him on this. And then I was the I was the the kind of the only English person in the Paris ad agency at J. Walter Thompson and anybody internationally wanted to get anything done was like, yeah, yeah, there's this young British guy. He'll get, he'll get it done for you. It was a wonderful time because back then, um, advertising was just going international and you had this incredible ad agency, Joe Thompson, where 90% of their revenue actually came from international accounts, but the sort of local management was totally anti-international accounts. <laughs> there yeah, were a yeah. number of, of dramas. And then I think, you know, from then on, it was just getting early into tech, showing how, uh, how that could drive success and you know did it in australia and you know the simplistic versions they sort of said can you come to new york and do what you did in uh in australia in 2002 i was the ceo of australia in 2005 i was the global ceo <laughs> also we probably neglected to mention the number one skill i have which is luck um so I, i've always been insanely lucky and uh, i remember when i first moved to new york to run the ad agency and they hadn't won any business for a while and you know day two i get this thing on my desk which is a an invitation to pitch charles schwab three months later we've pitched and won the charles schwab business and created what was a, a great campaign talk to chuck and
you always said to me that you were the luckiest bastard alive. He said, you really are, aren't you? And I'm, yep, yeah, I am. I am. Hard work makes preparation. And a bit of luck. A lot. Uh, how about like a moment as you're running in these different ad agencies across the globe? What, what was the moment where you're like, oh, I could, I could start my own business? Look, I think I'd always wanted to be an entrepreneur. Um, you know, and I'd always wanted my own business. And, and actually, I just had such a fantastic 15 year career at Havas that, you know, any time I was almost getting, you know, all itchy feet, they'd come and offer me something great. So, as you know, I joined them to run Australia. And then they asked me to run global brands. Then they asked me to go to New York and run New York. Then they asked me to run the main global ad agency and eventually to run the, the public listed company. And I think there was, you know, one side of it, which was just, I'd always wanted to do it. And then I suddenly I was in the top job and there wasn't another job. But I think being honest, there were, there's um, probably one of the key things. There's one of the best selling Harvard Business School case studies, very successful case study, which tells the story of me being unsuccessful. Um, a case study is called Have Us Change Faster. And it basically tells the story that in back in 2010, I thought the creator economy was going to be huge. And I thought the best way of disrupting a large legacy holding company would be to be the ones who embrace, um, you know, the creator economy. So uh, there's a brilliant company called Victors and Spoils. It was the, the largest and the first creator economy business. They just won Harley Davidson globally. John Windsor was the brilliant founder. I said to John, hey, why don't you join? You become chief innovation officer. We'll, we'll, we'll acquire the company. And the, the case study basically tells the story that despite my investors thinking it was a great idea, and even more importantly, my clients loving it, a lot of people who work for me thought I was the stupidest person on the planet. And we're like, well, hang on, we have a, we have a creative department. They're unbelievably expensive and super rare. And our job is to sell that rare creative talent at a lot, for a lot of money to clients. How can you possibly tell them that everyone can create? Now, we know how this all plays out. You know, there's 60 million people in the creator economy today. And as an aside, we're seeing exactly the same thing being said about AI and machine generated content like a machine can't create. Yes, they will. And they can. Well, let's but get back it, to that. It just, it just taught me that, you know, it's really hard to change big legacy businesses. And that actually it was so, I could see so clearly what it was that brands wanted. I wanted to be the person who solved that. And the best way of doing that was building a company from scratch. Two things. One, talk to me about artificial intelligence and the impact it's going to have on uh, content as it's already happening. But yeah, look, I mean, I think I, I, I think I honestly don't think you can overstate just how dramatically is going to totally change the world of marketing, the world of business in the world like nothing else we have ever seen before. This will be way bigger than the Industrial Revolution. This will be bigger than television, the Internet and mobile combined. And I am totally convinced of that. And you can dig this video out in 10 years and yeah. show it to me. And, and I think, you know, the, there are a few reasons for that. Firstly, the world's biggest companies are all saying that and spending billions of dollars on ensuring that it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So even, even if we think it's rubbish, like there's gazillions of dollars being spent making it happen. Secondly, look at the financial markets. I mean, you know, if I'd have said to you two years ago that NVIDIA would become the world's most invalu valuable company and they made AI chips, we don't be silly. I've not even heard of them. You know, now, obviously, there's, there's a bit of position jockeying that goes on between Apple, Microsoft, and NVIDIA. But, you know, the fact that after losing a bit of value, they're still worth two and a half trillion. Uh, so the world's investors are saying that, that they believe in this. More importantly, the world's people are saying it. It's the, you know, ChatGPT was the fastest technology in history to get to 100 million users. And if you play around with this stuff, it is absolutely remarkable. I mean, over the summer, I'm sure you saw it, a creator made a TV commercial uh, for Volvo in under 24 hours. It's absolutely stunning. Not a single image in that was shot. It was all text to video. And something that literally a year ago would have cost a million dollars and taken six months can now be done for very little money in under 24 hours. You know, the speed with which the models are evolving is crazy. And I think the final point I would make is, you know, everything else we've, we've had to cope with or we've had the opportunity to leverage in the last 50, 60 years of marketing um, has been a vertical. So TV advertising was a vertical. Yes, it, you know, there are many brands for which it was brilliant, but it wasn't something for everyone. The internet was a vertical, mobile's a vertical, e-commerce is a vertical, social media is a vertical. They are really big things and many, many brands use them, but it's not something that is completely everywhere and pervasive everywhere. 
The difference with generative AI, it's a horizontal. There's not a single thing that you do as a human that you cannot do better, faster, and cheaper with technology. Now, of course, we're sort of, you know, we're talking about it today. 100% of the headlines are about Gen AI, and in reality, less than, you know, 0.001% of the content um, is actually a around Gen AI. But I almost, I sort of feel like I own, I've owned this door, I've looked into a room, and you see that someone's invented electricity. And you kind of go, oh, my God, that's going to change the world. And then you close the door and come back into the world that actually most people haven't worked out is going to be changed. And, and I think the big thing really is that it's not about the future. And so we own a company called Pencil. They started making ads using Gen AI in 2018. They've made over a million ads using Gen AI across 5,000 brands, put a billion dollars of spend through the platform. Every single time our clients start working with and using Pencil, they're able to produce content that is 10 times faster, that is 2x the performance and is 50% cheaper. So it's not that, you know, in the future we will be able to, you know, it's just, it, it's happening now. And it's just that everyone isn't aware that you can do that. But, you know, guarantee you if we have a chat in two or three years time, like it's inconceivable for me that 100% of the content we create will not be made using some component of generative AI. So I'm going to go back to the large agencies and you mentioning like build, building your own from the ground up. And I know it, it's not like the traditional agency that I'm referencing now, but I'm, I'm curious because you know that space so well and you've led large agencies. What's going to happen to those companies as the demand from their clients is like, we expect this cost to be lower because you're using AI. Or are they going to have to like cut half their staff over the next couple of years, retool their staff? What do you so think is going to happen? I, I think, you know, firstly, if you look at how the world of marketing is, is probably going to change, in my, my opinion. So we'll see if that, but I, you know, we're going to see an enormous explosion in the amount of content created because one of the barriers to creating content is it's expensive. Well, if it's not expensive, then, you know, brands that have not been supported before, suddenly you can, you can actually create content for them. We're going to see hyper-personalization. So we're going to see an ability to target people with incredibly personalized, but super relevant messages that hopefully will be much less annoying than some of the the evil things that ad tech did. You know, we're going to see the ability to target multiple niches. So we'll no longer have to say, because if you think about the world of marketing today, it's basically all built on the foundation that it's very expensive to make TV commercials. So we kind of need to really hone in on one target audience and then make a TV commercial for them. And I'm obviously making it a bit simplistic, but yeah, it yeah. wasn't like, well, we can make 50 TV. Well, you actually can now. And I, I personally believe that about 70% of the future of marketing is going to be much more like the New York Stock Exchange. And in the deck, and I can talk a little bit about our AI, AI journey, but in my original Raise deck back in 2015, when I, I created the company, we had a, you know, I had a photo of the New York Stock Exchange 40 years ago. And on the left, tons of people, lots of phones, bits of paper taking orders. And on the right hand side, you know, basically there's a Bloomberg TV set. It's all done electronically. And I think 70% of marketing will be done with no human in the loop, it's human outside the loop. It will be changed, optimized, reserved, and targeted. We're all done by Gen AI. And then I think about 30% is going to be incredibly high touch, high human involvement. And so, you know, this like, we can go on. high human involvement. So, like, you know, AI and Gen AI is a tool and brilliant creative. I, mean, I think we're going to see the greatest creative revolution we've seen in history. So there's a bit of, oh, you know, it's either people go, oh, I'm going to lose my job to a machine, or they go, ha. I'm way more creative and better than a machine. It couldn't possibly replace me. Like, it's neither. It's like every time in human history, we've been given incredible technology. Humans have done amazing things with it. And, and the ability to be so much more creative with generative AI is, is exceptional because you, you, you know, almost the creative director role becomes way more important because in a world where you can create anything and anything really fast, you know, deciding what you should be creating and what you should be putting out is more and more important. So you're going to see incredible pieces of content created I mean, the, the Volvo that I talked about is an example, just a brilliant creator creating an amazing TV commercial, but that's got super high human involvement because there's a human guiding this technology, prompting, changing, editing, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, you know, you're going to see this, uh, just a dramatic shift in the way marketing is done and there will be winners and losers. Now, you know, I have my point of view on that. I'm sure the holding companies think they're going to do really well. 
I think the one thing I would say, and if you go back to that Harvard Business School case study and, and the professor, Mike Tushman, who, who was one of the two people who put it together, and he lectures a lot on disruption, you know, it is very, very, very rare in history that the big incumbents are the leaders after the revolution. You know? Now, it doesn't mean to say it's impossible, but I think it's very hard. Um, and that actually, you know, that was why I created the company. It was like, I, I you know, and, and you talked about agencies. We sort of said, well, look, we'll never buy agencies and we'll never buy media agencies. Not because we don't think it's really valuable. I mean, clients absolutely need that. All of our clients need an ad agency and a media agency. It's just that it was, you know, I looked at it when it's a super competitive industry. They're very good at it. It's not growing very fast. And the financial markets don't view it as particularly valuable. So what I kind of said is that what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new kind of company based out of a passionate belief that you could do all marketing better, faster, and cheaper using technology. We had AI and machine generated content as a, as a founding uh, vertical. And I set about acquiring you know, tech or tech enabled companies that solved our clients' biggest pain points. And then putting that together at global scale. And because I wanted to go fast, I, I, did, I did something which was quite easy at the time, but with hindsight, um, probably wouldn't have been if someone had told me how hard it was supposed to be. But, with my founding partner, Jean-Marc, we, we raised you know, $300 million to go build the business because we wanted to move fast so that we could get to scale. And I think, you know, it's sort of, I'd summarize it by saying when we started and said, hey, you can do all marketing better, faster and cheaper using technology. No one understood what it meant, but no one else was trying to do it. Now, when I say that, everyone goes, oh, I get that. Like instantly, I don't have to spend any time explaining what we're doing, but you know, half the world is saying they're doing it too. So first, a quick, on the brand tech group and then and then i want to know what it feels like to raise 300 million dollars i'm gonna i'll write a book one day called the 300 million dollar powerpoint and actually as an aside the most boring deck i've ever 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 done in my life uh, and because i wrote the first one and the first deck and i showed it to uh, someone who's very smart in the world of finance said david that's a terrible deck i'm like what and he said no this is a great deck to explain to a brand why they should work with you it is a terrible deck to raise money so I then sat down and rewrote a really boring deck. <laughs> finance, the finance it obviously like... works. No, look, I mean, very simply with the brand tech group, you know, today we're the largest digital only content business in the world uh, with a number one in, in generative AI. And you might go, yeah, yeah, whatever. But we literally are, it's, you know, you can, you can go spend a ton of time looking on Google. There's only one platform in the world that has made, you know, over a million ads across 5,000 brands using generative AI and has been doing that since 2018. The platform on the one hand integrates all of the best models. So from ChatGPT to Gemini to Stability to Adobe Firefly, plugging into the Getty database, plugging into client dams. On the other side, it connects into ad accounts of TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, etc. And then in the middle, you arrive at the platform and, you know, it basically it's all prompt and it said, what do you want to do? Do you want to, you know, create a finished TikTok video or just want an insight or just want a pack shot or just want, and you literally go through the process. And one of the special things about it is it's predictive. We have a billion dollar data set. And what that allows you to do is as you're creating, you'll get a little dot on, on the image and it will give you a prediction. If it's orange, it's likely to perform in the bottom 25% of your ad account. If it's green in the top 25, and if it's blue, we don't know. So it might be worth a try. And, and I think we're, you know, we're seeing it roll out at incredible speed across our top uh, clients. And we've got, you know, numerous highly successful case studies in market. And that's the point. It's not like in the future, we will do this. No, this is, is doing it already. And I think we're sort of, um, we're in the, I would say like in the, the last 18 months, two years has been interesting because I think probably phase one was brands kind of go, oh, this AI stuff's interesting, but you know, I'm not sure I'm ready for it. And by the way, our legal people have said, you know, we, we shouldn't be doing this. Phase two was, hey, this is exciting. Let's do a pilot. And phase three is, uh, this works like crazy. Can we roll this out at scale globally as fast as possible? And so I think we're seeing amazing, amazing traction. Then with the way the group is structured, you know, Oliver is the world's number one in building in-house content studios. And so they're increasingly building Gen AI content studios. So if you want an in-house Gen AI content studio, Oliver can build it for you. Jellyfish is a brilliant performance marketing and media company who is a, has a fantastic platform. First model is, is brilliant at training, and that's going to be increasingly important. I think they're one of, if not Google's largest training partner in, in North America. 
and then you have the pencil platform that you know is the number one gen AI marketing platform and all of that is turbocharged by our creator economy businesses so you know we own collectively which is one of the the world's leading influencer marketing businesses they're doing a residencies with gen AI creators and the stuff they're able to produce is exceptional similarly mo film so there's sort of it's basically you know model that's all been built to leverage and, and exploit AI and, and generative AI and like you know, touch wood, the, the timing's pretty good. How about the legal side of it? What are, do you get pushback from people or like some people's philosophy is that they don't really use generative AI? What are some people saying from that kind of legal, ethical um, standpoint? Yeah, so look, it, I, it's a brilliant question. And in fact, interestingly, I, you know, we have a, an exceptional general counsel and I, I sort of said like in the old world, your legal teams would come in at the end of the process when you'd signed the contract or they would be responsible for signing the contract. In the new world, they're actually the first meeting. And we've spent an enormous amount of time with a lot of our clients just talking about, well, how can you use this safely? So the fir first thing is that we have, you know, put on a green list all of the platforms that we believe are, are safe for brands to work with. And so there are a number of platforms who will do, you know, lots of random stuff with your data or won't give you copyright. So basically, you know, all the platforms we're working with will assign you copyright, will give a no train policy on your data. So they're not going to start sharing your data back with, you know, your will indemnify you if it's their issue, not yours. On the platform, there's a, a prompt log for every single prompt. So if there is a problem, we can go back and see, you know, well, actually the prompt was X, it was the platform. So, but likewise, we've also built pencils so it won't allow you to say hey do me a, do me an image in the style of andy warhol or i like, copy the latest coke ad it won't let you do things like that so that you know, the majority of issues can really be addressed relatively easily as long as you are sensible about the way you do it and once people kind of understand how you can use it all safely from a legal perspective there's ethical reasons as well we we have a product called bias breaker that we launched if you ask most of the models for, you know, a CEO, um, the majority of them will come back with a, like a 50 year old, 50 year old white guy with a beard. So we've built in different layers of intersectional diversity so that you actually won't have that happen. And I think we're big believers in, you know, we're very pro tech. We wouldn't be doing what we are doing, but we're also big believers in responsible tech. Yeah. But what, what uh, are you worried about the future of AI? Not just speaking about like the marketing aspect to it and, and what it can do there, but just maybe social, you know, what does society look like 10, 20 years from now because of this technology? Are you worried about it? Are you excited about it? Look, I mean, I'm super excited about it. I mean, I'm worried about the one thing I'm worried about is climate, but I'm 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 not worried about the AI piece. And I think, you know, I, humans are wonderful. We're sort of, we have irrational fears. You know, if, if, and one of the slides I use in some of my decks, I've got like a great white shark on the left and a little VW beetle on the right. And you show it to people and you ask them like, which is most dangerous? Oh, the shark, you know, and 15, 20 people get killed every year in shark attacks. A million people die driving cars. People will drive to the beach in a place where a shark has never, ever been in history and are swimming in the sea going, I'm going to get taken, I'm going to get taken. And yet they will have driven there in their car and back. And that is the single most dangerous thing that most of us ever do in our lifetimes. And, you know, they're not even giving it a second thought. And, and look, I'm not, I, I'm not saying that there are no issues that come with it. Clearly, there are a, a number of them. But I, I think the, the, the all probability, because all of these things we talk about have happened with every giant revolution in history. I mean, the industrial revolution, you know, I mean, the, the, the term Luddite comes from the Luddites who were totally anti-machines and destroyed them and believed this would end humanity. And I think it's similar. And I, and, and I think every time humans have been given exceptional tools in history, they've done amazing things with them. They've created huge progress. It's created jobs. It's brought people out of poverty. It's improved the standard of living. It's improved education. And I think this will be no different this time around. And, and, you know, if you look at a simplistic argument back in the 1800s, well over 90% of the population m worked in making food, you know, worked on farms or making food in some way, shape or form. Today, it's less than 2%. So you could conclude there should be mass employment, un unemployment in the world. Because if we've gone from the 1800s where over 90% of people did a thing and now less than 2%, presumably ev everyone's out of a job. Well, no, it's just... There's, there's going to be 
the most amazing. So I think that that's when it comes to the employment piece. And then I think, yes, there are clear issues on the ethics side of things. There are clear issues, you know, about the negativity that this can deliver. But if you think about when social media came along, nobody was like, oh, this is going to be terrible for the world. Everyone's like, oh, this is cool. I can, my mom can see photos of my kids. Now, actually, no, what happened is it rigged elections, divided countries, spread fake news, caused teen suicide and anxiety, and it had a whole bunch of really negative impacts. And I think the fact that we're having the discussion about the negative impact of Gen AI before it's arrived is actually a real positive. I would be, uh, it would be a mistake not to bring up um, One Young World. Are you guys addressing this type of question at the organization? I know it's climate is its main focus, correct? No, it's, I mean, basically the global goal. The global goals are its main focus. So we um, created the organization in 2008 um, and it's become the largest platform for young leaders driving change in the world. We write the largest uh, checks each year for young leaders initiatives around the global goals, but we report our impact um, under all of the, the 17 UN goals, global goals. Uh, and, and so it's very broad ranging. We see climate's a huge focus. Gender equality is a huge focus. But you, you would, the kind of key subjects we obsess on, you would, you would expect it's our community of brilliant young leaders who vote on them. There's sort of 2000 who attend every year. We have a whole day next week in Montreal because the summit's next week. The 17th um, is the Indigenous Young Leaders Day because, um, you know, a real uh, important area and Im incredibly important learnings from Indigenous peoples and Indigenous young leaders. And then, yeah, the, ma the main summit will cover everything from climate to education to responsible AI. And, you know, it's pretty... It's pretty exceptional. We'll have 2,000 young people from 195 countries there. We have Time 100, you know, list members, Nobel Peace Prize nominees. Um, and every year I kind of sit there just somewhat in awe of what people are doing in their sort of 20s and early 30s. And then we have uh, some incredible senior leaders, you know, so Jane Goodall, Sylvia Earle, Bob Geldof, Mohammed Yunus. So, yeah, it should be it should be a pretty spectacular summit. Awesome. Uh, that's great. Um... Do you have time for one more? One more. Sure. So I want to go back to uh, the Brand Tech Group. You're a founder, you're a CEO, and you mentioned uh, how you guys raised a lot of money, you acquired quickly, and you wanted to move fast. How are you balancing the innovation to create the right products and services to maximize the business with knowing when to start doing that? Like, when, when do you know to, this is the product and service we need to run with? Versus we got to keep innovating to find it. No, I think it's a brilliant question. And I, I did a talk a couple of years ago to a bunch of entrepreneurs. And I thought actually the, uh, it was about giving them some advice. And I thought what I'd do is I'd reach out to, you know, 17, 18 really smart founders and just ask them for one piece of advice and then turn that into a presentation. And, and one of them um, who has a, a sort of a, a cloud uh, Internet of Things business, he said, he said you know, your, your job as the founder is to keep the business alive until it hits the inflection point. And look, I think, um, you know, the... But you know what it's like to run a, a mature company. Sure, sure. And I, but, and, and I think, look, on it, so if you start there, like the, the reason big companies get disrupted, actually not because they're crap, it's because they're very good. You know, they are doing something that is incredibly successful and making them a ton of money. Mm -hmm. Why would you possibly stop doing that to do this little thing that's tiny and makes no money? Yeah. Then what happens is that, you know, Somebody like a little entrepreneur decides, hey, I think I can build like, a really cool little business. Or, and when you're starting out and there's one or two or three of you, you don't actually need that much revenue or that much money to have a business. But what happens is that little business grows and grows and grows. And suddenly one day this thing has become huge and it's now too late for the big company to adapt. And whether you talk about, you know, Kodak invented digital photography and managed to go out of business. How could that be a thing? I mean, 20 years ago, one of my favorite headlines that I use in presentations is the maybe a little bit more, but it's the front front page of the New York Times. And Barnes and Noble is suing Amazon because they are daring. They have the audacity to claim that they're the world's number one online retailer of books. And so the first first thing is like, you know, Barnes and Noble obviously don't really think online retailer books is a thing. And we all think back then that it's credible that Barnes and Noble might be bigger than Amazon. And now, you know, remember when we thought Amazon might just do books rather than every single thing on the planet? And I think that's the, the lesson. And so it's much easier for an 
an entrepreneur to start something new and build and scale. And you just end up building up the expertise and the knowledge of something that suddenly is very, very hard for the big legacy businesses to pivot. And then I think when you are, you know, when, you know, and you found your product market fit, the it's all about scaling. I mean, if I look at us today, we have amazing traction with brands. Pretty much everyone who has a presentation wants to do a pilot. Everyone who does a pilot wants to turn to a scale deployment. And what is going to mean that make the difference between how successful we are over the next two, three, four years is do we have enough expert talent using the platform to ensure that the work we're creating is exceptional? Because the difference between a novice and a talented user using the platform is the difference between you looking in and going, that is a bit terrible, isn't it? And wow, that's amazing. And so I think also understanding like what are your bottlenecks and how do you get ahead of those and how do you make sure that, you know, you haven't had 2000 people ahead of needing them. So you actually go out of business, but likewise, you don't actually miss out on your ability to deliver because you didn't hire anyone and you know, you've, you've got two people and you suddenly need 2000. So look, I think a lot of these things are the sort of the complexity of the entrepreneur's journey. And I think as humans, we also like to, we also like to look at other people and go, oh, it was all, you know, it was just so easy. They just had this thing in it. I mean, I love when you unpack the, the Amazon story. I mean, there was a day they lost 96% off their market cap. You know, we've forgotten that now. They've always been worth a gazillion dollars. Uh, there was a great little video doing the rounds recently which explained the time that Microsoft saved Apple by putting, you know, 200, 250 million in, other they, otherwise they were going under. Yeah. You know, it's inconceivable today that a company like Apple could ever have been in a situation. And I think, honestly, it's sort of, it's another of the, the sort of entrepreneur sayings, you know, when it's good, it's never as good as you think it is. And when it's bad, it's never as bad as it feels. You know, when, when it's bad, you think it's the end of the world and it actually isn't. And when it's good, you know, it's probably not as permanent and as perfect as you think. And honestly, I mean, the really sad story on that, you know, you'll have seen the tragic death of Mike Lynch, who was one of Britain's most brilliant entrepreneurs. Yeah, I mean, yeah. he spent several years and I imagine, and I didn't know him well, but I met him a couple of times. I imagine, you know, all he would have been thinking about is how terrible it was to be, you know, extradited to the US and to have this trial for fraud that he won. And, and you know, and then he gets tragically killed in, um, in the boat sinking in Italy and like, you know, he, he would probably give anything to come back and, you know, have his biggest problem be that he's in a, in the court of law every day and facing yeah. 10 years in prison. And so I think it's just, you know, trying to keep stuff into keep things. Can I finish with your advice to a founder CEO? Your own judgment, listen to other people, but at the end of the day, you've got to trust your judgment. I would say pretty much anything and everything that we, that we have done over the last nine years, most people tell me was a bad idea. Starting from, and I, you know, I went to see four or five really clever, smart people in finance who all told me, David, you will not be able to run, to raise $300 million with a PowerPoint. It just won't happen. And if I'd have listened, we wouldn't, wouldn't have had the company. When, when we were investing in AI and buying uh, AI companies, it's like, what are you doing that for? Like what? And so I think if you think something is right, I think pretty much every entrepreneur will, will tell you that more people or even most people have told them that what they're doing is not going to work. It's, there's not a market for that. And so I think you've just, you just got to believe in you. I mean, I think being an entrepreneur, you need an enormous amount of self-belief and I, not meaning self-confidence. You don't necessarily need to be able to stand up and speak in front of a room, but you need that self-belief when people are constantly telling you that what you're doing is wrong and is not going to work that you know, I think it is, and I'm going to keep going. Good. Well, I appreciate that. And I'm sure the listeners will too. David, thanks for joining me and telling me about yourself and, and the Brand Tech Group. It's a pleasure, Chris. Great to chat. Likewise.